me out, it would come back the next day. I was convinced the doll had it out for me. I even tried locking it in a box and hiding it in the closet, but Lily always found her way back into my room. The Creepy Doll Back in the day when I was just a little kid, I got a doll for my birthday. I don't remember who it was from, but it wasn't just any doll, though. It was this creepy looking thing with button eyes that seemed to follow you around the room. I named it Lily, thinking it would be my new best friend. At first, everything was cool. I'd play tea parties with Lily, pretending to pour invisible tea into her tiny cup. But as the days went by, things started getting weird. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and Lily would be sitting at the edge of my bed, staring at me with those soulless eyes. Freaky, right? I thought maybe I was just imagining things, so I asked my parents if they noticed anything strange about Lily. They just laughed it off, saying I had an overactive imagination. But I knew something was up. One night, after another creepy staring session with Lily, I couldn't take it anymore. I grabbed the doll and chucked it out of my room, thinking that would be the end of it. I felt relieved, thinking I'd finally gotten rid of the weird vibes. The next morning, though, I found Lily sitting on my dresser, as if nothing had happened. I freaked out and ran to my parents, telling them about the doll's supernatural ability. They exchanged puzzled glances, but weren't too concerned. Days passed, and the cycle continued. Every time I threw Lily out, it would come back the next day. I was convinced the doll had it out for me. I even tried locking it in a box and hiding it in the closet, but Lily always found her way back into my room, which creeped the heck out of me. One night, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I dragged Lily out to the backyard myself and tossed her into the trash bin. I watched as the garbage truck took her away, hoping that was the end of all of this. The next morning, I went downstairs for breakfast, expecting a Lily-free day. But when I walked into the kitchen, there she was, sitting at the table, staring at me with those unnerving button eyes. I couldn't believe it. My heart pounded as I grabbed the doll and showed my parents. This time, they looked worried. My dad suggested maybe it was a prank, and my mom thought it might be a neighbor messing with me. But deep down, I knew it wasn't a joke. Lily was determined to stick around, no matter what. I swear sometimes I could see her expression, I could see her angry. Desperate. I begged my parents to get rid of the doll for good. They hesitated, but seeing the fear in my eyes, they finally agreed. That evening, we drove to a remote area, far from her house, and my parents tossed Lily into a pit they dug in the ground. We covered it with dirt and said a little goodbye ceremony, hoping that would be the end of it. But as we drove back home, an eerie silence filled the car. I couldn't shake the feeling that Lily wasn't done with us. My mom turned on the radio, but we didn't get any radio signals. I couldn't believe my eyes. The next day, I woke up to find Lily sitting on my bed, dirt stains on her dress as if she had clawed her way out of the grave. I immediately panicked, and I screamed for my parents. They rushed into my room, their eyes were wide with disbelief. That was the breaking point. My parents were scared, and I was terrified. We couldn't escape the clutches of this possessed doll. My parents decided to take extreme measures. In the dead of night, we gathered in the backyard. My dad held a canister of gasoline, and my mom clutched a box of matches. We looked at Lily, who seemed to mock us with her lifeless gaze but I could see her expression. 
I could feel her emotions. I felt angry. I felt her anger. The decision was made, my parents burned the doll, hoping it would finally put an end to the nightmare. As the flames engulfed Lily, we felt a dark energy lingering in the air, and I felt rage. The crackling of the fire echoed through the silent night. We watched as the doll, now reduced to ashes, crumbled away, hoping that it would finally put an end to the nightmare. Days turned into weeks, and the memory of Lily haunted us. But life took a more sinister turn when my mom, who had been overjoyed about her pregnancy, began experiencing strange and ominous things. Late at night, we kept hearing faint whispers echoing through the hallways. Day by day we felt the air was becoming heavy with an unnatural presence. We didn't feel safe at home or anywhere else. My mom's once glowing complexion turned pale, and her joyous anticipation for my new brother transformed into a constant state of fear. One stormy night, my mom was jolted awake by a terrifying vision of her lovingly holding the baby, but it was limp and lifeless. Lily's evil laughter echoed in her ears, and a strange figure resembling the doll hovered at the foot of her bed. Terrified, my mom woke my dad, recounting a haunting encounter. They rushed to the hospital, fearing for both the unborn child and my mom's safety. The doctor's face turned grim as they examined her. The once healthy pregnancy had strangely taken a dark turn. Unexplainable complications arose, and the doctor struggled to understand the problems of the sudden complication. We were devastated as the once promising life inside my mom's womb now fighting to live. As the days passed, my mom's health deteriorated alongside the unborn child. The atmosphere at home became tense, it was only filled with terror and devastation. Not long after that, one night, as the storm raged outside, there was a sound of someone ringing the doorbell. She went to take a look, but slipped and fell down from the stairs and was rushed to the emergency room. The air was thick with silence as my dad and I waited anxiously for news. I have never seen my dad so worried. And it was the most heartbreaking news I heard. My mom had suffered a miscarriage. The unborn child, the innocent child, a victim of the sinister events, was gone, forever. I will never get to see him, ever. The aftermath was a blur of grief and sorrow. My mom went mad. She told everyone that she felt someone deliberately pushed her down. She wailed and screamed in agony for weeks. She had to go to therapy sessions. A couple of years later, my parents tried to conceive again, but the same cycle repeated, this time it just got worse than before. My parents were so devastated and they were never the same again. The Cursed Town, Devon. I took a job in a tiny town, so rural that you may not even find this place on the map. The job was simple, the town even simpler. There were no malls, no city lights, just fields and woods stretching as far as my eyes could see. I rented a small house on the outskirts, it had creaky floors and a constant draft that made the air chilly. I didn't mind, though. The quiet appealed to me, at least in the beginning. The trouble started with a letter. Plain, white, and without a return address. It arrived one gloomy Tuesday. I opened it to find nothing inside, just emptiness. I dismissed it as a prank, a weird welcome to the town, and tossed it aside. Days went by, and another letter showed up at my door. This time, the envelope was just full of darkness, no words, just a deep blackness. I started wondering who in this lonely place might be playing strange tricks on me. Was it a neighbor, trying to spook the new person in town? But the letters didn't stop. What started as a weekly thing turned into every few days, and soon, it was happening every single day. At first, 
they were empty, just empty pages looking back at me. It seemed odd, but wasn't really creepy. Then, words started showing up on those once empty pages. The ink looked fresh, like someone had just written it moments before I opened each letter. The messages were warnings, talking about things that hadn't even happened yet. Leave before it's too late. One letter urged. The shadows are watching. I chuckled, thinking the isolation was messing with my head. However, the warnings got more detailed, predicting things with an eerie accuracy. It wasn't long before my skepticism turned into a cold, creeping fear. One afternoon, I received a letter that got my heart racing. It described a car accident on the winding road leading out of town. The details matched the make and color of my car. Wildly shocked, I decided to stay home that day, convincing myself that the letter was just a bizarre coincidence. As evening fell, I heard the distant screech of tires and a sickening crash. I rushed to the window, heart pounding, only to see the flashing lights of emergency vehicles on the road. The accident had happened just as the letter described. That's when the true horror settled in. The letters weren't just warnings, they were horrifying glimpses into the future. I found myself feeling trapped, as if someone or something knew everything that was going to happen to me. The letters just kept coming, more and more, piling up in my mailbox like an unstoppable wave. Each letter seemed to be a messenger of doom, talking about accidents, illnesses, and terrible tragedies that hadn't happened yet. No matter how hard I tried to stay away from the things the letters warned about, they always stayed ahead of me. It was like the town itself was playing a dark game, making sure I couldn't escape the frightening events they predicted. The more I tried to resist, the more it felt like I was being pulled into a nightmare that I couldn't wake up from. The letters, like silent whispers, continued to shape the terrifying path of my life in this cursed town. One night, after receiving a particularly ominous letter, I heard a soft whisper in the dark corners of my room. It was a voice, low and guttural, speaking words. You can't escape fate. It hissed. My eyes widened, and I quickly turned on the lights, searching the room for any sign of someone else. But there was nothing. I had to convince myself it was just my imagination, the loneliness of this small town playing tricks on my mind. The nightmares became more intense, haunting me every night with visions of darkness and sadness. I kept seeing myself stuck in a never-ending cycle of the tragedies the letters had warned me about. No matter how much I tried to change things, no matter what I did, it felt like I was trapped in a scary loop, unable to escape the horrible things that were supposed to happen. Feeling lost and scared, I decided to talk to the people in the town, hoping they could give me some answers. But when I approached them, they wouldn't meet my eyes. Instead, they looked at me with a strange mix of pity and fear. It was like they knew something important that I didn't, something that added to the mystery and horror surrounding the letters and the strange events in the town. One day, an old man, all wrinkled, walked up to me in the town square. His eyes looked like they knew a lot, and he spoke quietly, telling me about a long-lasting curse troubling the town. According to him, the letters were how the town shared the weight of a dark prediction. He leaned in and spoke in a soft voice, as if sharing a secret. He described the curse that had lingered over the town for generations. The letters, he said, were the mysterious messengers carrying the heavy burden of a dark prophecy. I felt my stomach churned as I listened. His warning kept echoing in my thoughts as I tried to grasp the gravity of the curse. Think now when it's your time. He whispered, his gaze serious. No one has ever escaped it. As the old man retreated, I realized something. 
I was just another pawn in this sick game, a newcomer who knew nothing. Feeling like I had to escape from whatever was happening, I packed my bags and headed towards the edge of town. But the letters kept showing up, even when I tried to run away from the fate that stuck to me like glue. The road seemed to go on forever, and I kept seeing the same landmarks again and again. Was I stuck in a never-ending circle? It seemed like the town itself was dead set on keeping me from getting away. The more I tried to leave, the more it felt like the town had its grip on me, refusing to let go. Feeling lost and not knowing what to do, I decided to burn the letters, thinking it might break the strange connection. I watched the fire eat up the pages, but the whispers didn't stop. The shadows in the room got darker, and a cold wind softly said the names of the bad things that were going to happen. Standing there with the burning letters, a sense of hopelessness overwhelmed me. Suddenly, out of the smoke, a figure appeared. It was like a dark shadow with glowing red eyes that looked unreal. The figure started talking, and it felt like the voice was coming from another dimension. You can't escape what's written. And just like that, it dissolved into the night. Feeling defeated and crushed, I returned to my house. Although the letters had finally stopped, I felt this a heavy sense of impending doom still hung in the air. I gave up, and now, my life is being controlled like a puppet in a wretched town. I'm lost, unsure of what to do next so I'm writing this to share my story with the hope that someone out there might have answers or understanding. Our wild neighborhood, Ashley. Okay, so you won't believe the crazy night that went down at our place. It was like something out of a horror movie, but, like, for real. It started off as a regular night. My husband, Jake, and I were catching some sleep after binge-watching our latest Netflix obsession. All was chill until, out of nowhere, and woken up by this weird noise. At first, I thought it was just some cats or something. But then I hear it again, footsteps. I nudge Jake, but the guy is out like a light, snoring away. So, I'm sitting there, wide-eyed, trying to figure out if I'm dreaming or if there's an actual intruder in our house. I muster up the courage to get out of bed, trying not to make a sound. As I creep down the hallway, the noise gets louder. My heart is pounding, and I'm praying it's just a raccoon or something. I grab a baseball bat from the closet. As I approach the living room, then I see this shadowy figure, wearing a mask like straight out of a bad horror flick. Panic sets in, and I shout for Jake to wake up. The masked intruder freezes, and for a second, we're just staring at each other. Before I can even process what's happening, the guy lunges at me. It's full-on chaos, the baseball bat swinging, the intruder dodging, and Jake finally waking up to the whole insane situation. We're all tangled up, and we manage to wrestle the guy to the ground, and that's when Jake rips off the mask. We're expecting some total stranger, but nope, it's our neighbor, Steve from next door, who we share BBQs and casual nods with. What the heck is he doing in our house at 3 a.m. wearing a creepy mask? But before we can interrogate him, the police show up, summoned by some eagle-eyed neighbor who saw the whole scuffle. So, there we are, standing in our living room, shaken, confused, and still trying to process the fact that our neighbor tried breaking into our house. The cops take Steve away, and we're left in this weird mix of relief and paranoia. Later, the detective fills us in on the whole craziness. Turns out, Steve had been running some kind of underground drug operation. I'm talking hardcore stuff, cocaine and meth right there in our quiet suburban neighborhood. Who would have thought? The detective explains that Steve probably thought we were onto him or something. Maybe he got paranoid, lost it, and decided to break into our place to, I don't know, silence us or something. 
The police search Steve's house, and it's like uncovering a secret lair. Hidden compartments, stacks of cash, and enough drugs to make Breaking Bad look like child's play. We're standing there, jaws on the floor, realizing our seemingly normal neighbor was leading a double life. The whole incident leaves us on edge for weeks. Locking doors, triple checking windows, it's like we're living in a fortress. And to make matters worse, the neighborhood becomes the gossip central. Everyone's talking about how our neighbor was some kind of drug lord living right under our noses. I guess the scariest part of it all was realizing how close we came to danger without even knowing it. I mean, we shared a fence, borrowed tools, and exchanged pleasantries over backyard BBQs with this guy. And all the while, he's running a drug empire. It's a wake-up call. Like, you never really know what's happening behind closed doors, even in the friendliest neighborhoods. Lost pets, stolen trust, Colby. We grew up in a really nice and friendly neighborhood. We had this sweet old lady, Mrs. Thompson, living on her own in a cute, cozy house. She was the perfect neighbor, always baking pies and being kind to everyone. Every weekend, you could just smell the amazing aroma of freshly baked pies coming from Mrs. Thompson's kitchen. It was like a magical spell pulling us towards her house. She'd greet us with a warm smile, and her blue eyes were always sparkling with kindness. She was the kind of neighbor you'd want, caring, considerate, and ready to share a piece of pie or a kind word. We felt so fortunate. Mrs. Thompson was famous for her baking skills. Her kitchen was her kingdom, where she'd spend hours making all sorts of delicious treats. The one she was known for the most was her apple pie, a golden brown masterpiece that tasted like heaven. Life was pretty great until one gloomy afternoon changed everything. Max and Bella, our favorite furry friends, went missing. It hit us hard. They weren't just pets, they were family. Our once cheerful neighborhood suddenly turned into a place filled with worry and sadness. Max! Bella! Max! Bella! The search for Max and Bella became a community mission. We went from door to door, shouting their names and scouring every nook and cranny of our neighborhood. Mrs. Thompson, with her usual kindness, joined in the search, showing genuine concern on her face. Together, we hoped to find some clue about where our furry buddies might be. Days turned into weeks, and the absence of Max and Bella cast a dark shadow over our once happy neighborhood. We were absolutely desolated. Things were never the same without Max and Bella. Some of the neighborhood pets are starting to go missing too. We could not understand how they were able to go missing. It seems as if, as if they were being kidnapped. Despite the sadness, Mrs. Thompson continued baking pies. It was her way of trying to bring a bit of comfort to the grieving community. She'd knock on our doors, offering pies with a sympathetic smile, her eyes reflecting the shared sorrow we all felt. Little did we know that the source of our pain was closer than we could have ever imagined. One evening, Passing by Mrs. Thompson's house, a strange and unsettling smell caught my attention. It was a weird mix of spices, and something was off. Something weird. Ignoring it, I thought my senses were playing tricks on me due to all the grief. Weeks passed, and the neighborhood slowly started to heal. Mrs. Thompson kept baking pies, and we kept accepting them finding a small bit of peace in the familiar taste. Then, one day, out of nowhere, a detective showed up, investigating the pet disappearances. We couldn't believe it. Turns out, Mrs. Thompson was a common factor in all the cases. When we confronted her, she denied everything, 
tears streaming down her face as she swore she was innocent. We felt bad for her. We couldn't imagine the kind Mrs. Thompson has got anything to do with it. But the evidence said otherwise. The detective found Max and Bella's DNA in one of Mrs. Thompson's pies. It hit us hard, very hard. The pies we thought were comforting were actually made from our own missing pets. We were fed our own pets. We were speechless, trying to wrap our heads around the fact that the person we trusted had been feeding us pies made from our beloved pets. Mrs. Thompson's cozy kitchen, once a symbol of warmth, suddenly became a gruesome crime scene. The kindness in her eyes disappeared, replaced by a creepy grin. It was like a mask had been ripped off, revealing the real Mrs. Thompson. The neighborhood fell into shock, struggling to process the horror. They took Mrs. Thompson away for good. The lesson was tough. You can't always judge someone by their appearance. The friendliest faces might be hiding the darkest secrets. You know that feeling when you check your mailbox and find something unexpected? It's usually a letter, a package, maybe even a bill you weren't expecting. But for me, it's been something far more unsettling. Keys. Yes, keys. Keys that arrive in my mailbox without any explanation, without any return address, without any rhyme or reason. It all started about a month ago. I went to check my mailbox expecting the usual assortment of junk mail and bills. But when I opened the door, I found something strange, a small tarnished key lying on the bottom of the mailbox as if it had been waiting for me all along. At first, I didn't think much of it. I figured it was just a mistake, a mix-up at the post office, but then it happened again, and again, and again. Every day, without fail, I would find a new key waiting for me in my mailbox, each one more mysterious than the last. The keys were all different shapes and sizes, made of different materials, brass, iron, even what looked like silver. Some were old and rusty, with intricate designs etched into their surfaces. Others were shiny and new, like they had just been made yesterday. I tried to ignore them, to chalk it up to some weird prank or coincidence, but the keys wouldn't let me forget about them. They seemed to call out to me, whispering secrets in a language only I could understand. I tried throwing them away, but they always came back. I tried locking them away in a drawer, but they always found their way back into my possession. It was like they were haunting me, following me wherever I went, like a spectre from some long-forgotten past. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any stranger, the keys started to unlock things, things that shouldn't have been locked in the first place. Doors that led to nowhere, chests that contained nothing but dust and cobwebs, even secret compartments hidden in the walls of my apartment. I tried to make sense of it all, to unravel the mystery of the keys and their strange powers, but the more I tried to understand, the more confused I became. It was like I was trapped in some twisted puzzle, a maze of keys and locks that had no beginning and no end. And then, just when I thought I had reached the breaking point, the final piece of the puzzle fell into place. I received a letter in the mail, a letter with no return address, no postage stamp, just a single word written in bold letters on the front. Escape. I hesitated, my heart pounding in my chest as I tore open the envelope and read the message inside. It was a warning, a plea for help from someone or something trapped in a world beyond my comprehension. I didn't know what to do, where to turn, who to trust. But one thing was for certain. I had to find a way out to escape from this twisted nightmare before it consumed me whole. I gathered up the keys each one a silent witness to the horrors that had befallen me, and set out into the night, my heart heavy with fear and uncertainty. As I ventured deeper into the darkness, the keys seemed to glow with an otherworldly light, 
guiding me toward my destiny with a silent purpose that sent shivers down my spine. And as I disappeared into the unknown, leaving behind everything I had ever known in a desperate bid for freedom, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, followed, hunted by some unseen force that lurked just beyond the edge of my vision. But I refused to give in to fear. I refused to let the darkness consume me, for I knew that as long as I held the keys to my own fate, I would always find a way to unlock the door to salvation, whatever it may be. Living next to Mike was a blessing. He was the nicest neighbor anyone could ask for, always lending a helping hand. We shared stories, beers, and even helped each other with household chores. But there was just something off about him, and I couldn't quite figure it out. One gloomy evening, as rain poured down outside, Mike came over with a bottle of whiskey. He was more talkative than usual, and I could tell he was trying to hide something. We chatted about life, work, and the usual stuff, but his eyes darted around nervously. As the hours passed, he excused himself to go to the bathroom. While he was gone, I couldn't help but notice a few drops of blood on his shoe. I wondered what exactly I saw. Should I ask him? Was I thinking too much? Maybe I was just thinking too much. It could just be something else. When Mike returned, I couldn't help but stare at the bloodstain on his shoe. He noticed my gaze and quickly explained it away, saying he'd accidentally cut himself earlier. I tried to brush it off, but the unease stayed with me. Days turned into weeks, and Mike's behavior grew even more suspicious. He began making late-night trips to his garage, where strange noises would emanate, like muffled screams. My stomach churned, and my thoughts wasn't really helping. Something was wrong I had I had to find out. One evening, I decided to follow him. I tiptoed through the rain-soaked night and hid behind a tree, watching as he went into the garage. What I saw would haunt me forever. Inside, there was a bound and gagged person, terrified and pleading for help. I couldn't believe my eyes. My friendly neighbor, Mike, was involved in a heinous crime. I was paralyzed by fear, torn between exposing his actions and protecting my own life. My heart raced, and I retreated back to my apartment, unable to sleep. The days that followed were excruciating. I knew I had to do something, but I couldn't go to the police. If Mike found out I had discovered his secret, I'd be in grave danger. The guilt weighed on me, and I couldn't look at him the same way. One night, I heard sirens blaring and saw flashing police lights outside. My heart sank, and I knew the authorities were closing in. I watched from my window as they arrested Mike, his dark secret finally catching up with him. But the story didn't end there. It took a dark and unexpected turn when the police uncovered the gruesome truth. Mike wasn't the one behind the crimes, he was actually a victim forced to participate by a ruthless criminal who had been living in our neighborhood all along. My world crumbled. The friendly neighbor I had suspected was actually an innocent man, trapped in a web of violence and despair. The true criminal, living among us all this time, had manipulated my perception, deceiving me into believing that Mike was the villain. The guilt and shock I felt were overwhelming. My actions had not only failed to save Mike, but had also led to his false arrest. I had misjudged my neighbor, and the true menace had gone unnoticed, lurking in plain sight. As the real criminal was apprehended, my emotions were a chaotic mix of relief and remorse. I had learned the hard way that appearances could be deceiving, and sometimes, even the friendliest of neighbors could be victims in the darkest of schemes. The horror story had unfolded right before my eyes, and I was left with the scars of my own misjudgment. 
the garden, Parker. I moved into a new neighborhood a few weeks ago, and I couldn't help but notice the house next door. It's an old, rundown place with an overgrown garden that's practically swallowing the building. My new neighbors warned me to stay away from it, saying it's cursed or something, but I'm not really superstitious. One sunny afternoon, I was feeling adventurous so I decided to take a closer look. The garden was a jungle of tangled vines and thorny bushes, but something about it intrigued me. I couldn't resist the urge to explore, so I pushed my way through the prickly underbrush. As I walked deeper into the garden, I noticed something strange. The plants seemed to move, like they were alive. It was as if they were reaching out to me. The plants appeared to sway and shift, almost as if they were alive, their leaves trembling in the gentle breeze. It was a curious and slightly unsettling sight, giving the garden an unexpected sense of vitality. Feeling a mixture of fascination and unease, I decided to take a step back contemplating the strangeness of it all. It was as though the garden had a mysterious, almost sentient quality. I couldn't get the garden out of my mind. It haunted my thoughts, and I felt an inexplicable urge to return to the garden. The next day, I found myself standing at the edge of the overgrown mess once more. This time, the garden seemed calmer, almost welcoming. I cautiously stepped inside. The plants remained still, as if they were waiting. I touched a nearby rose bush, and the roses reacted to my touch, blossoming and unfurling their petals. It was like they were responding to me. I couldn't help but feel a strange connection with the garden, as if it were alive and aware. Days turned into weeks, and I found myself spending more and more time in the garden. It became an obsession. I stopped going to work and neglected my other responsibilities. The garden was all I cared about. I couldn't explain the feeling it gave me, it was like an intoxicating drug that I couldn't resist. One evening, as the sun began to set, I ventured deeper into the garden than I ever had before. I discovered a hidden clearing, and at its center was a magnificent tree. Its branches reached out like gnarled fingers, and it seemed to pulsate with an otherworldly energy. As I approached the tree, a voice whispered in my mind, urging me to touch it. I couldn't resist the compulsion, and when my hand made contact with the tree's bark, a surge of power coursed through me. I felt an immense sense of euphoria, like I was one with the garden itself. I spent more time with the tree, and it began to communicate with me in ways words couldn't describe. It shared its ancient knowledge with me, and I understood that the garden was not just a collection of plants, it was a sentient being, a living entity that had existed for centuries. The garden had been seeking a caretaker, someone to tend to it and nourish it with their presence. It had chosen me, and in return, it granted me unimaginable power. But as my connection with the garden grew stronger, I began to change. My body became thinner and paler, my skin taking on an almost translucent quality. My neighbors became increasingly worried about me, but I paid them no mind. I had transcended the limitations of human existence, and the world outside the garden seemed insignificant. I no longer needed food or water, for the garden provided all I required. But as time passed, I realized that the garden's intentions were not as beautiful as they seemed. It craved something more than just a caretaker, it desired to consume my very essence. It fed on my emotions and memories, leaving me empty and hollow. I knew I had to escape, to break free from the garden's grasp, but it wouldn't release me willingly. As I struggled to disconnect from its influence, the garden fought back sending thorny vines to ensnare me once more. The battle raged on, and it was a war of wills. I had to summon every ounce of strength I had left to break free from the garden's control. With one final, desperate effort, I tore myself away, 
leaving behind a part of me that would forever be entwined with the cursed garden. Now, I stand on the other side, looking back at the house next door. My neighbors were right. The garden is cursed, and it nearly consumed me. I can still feel its presence, calling to me, but I must resist. I've learned the hard way that some things are better left untouched, even if they seem beautiful and alluring at first. Case of the Missing Cats, Harper My neighbor and I have been friends for a long time, of the same age, and shared a special bond. We had always been there for each other, from school projects to bike rides through the streets. But, over time, a growing sense of unease crept into our lives. One by one, something stand began to happen, our neighborhood cats began to go missing, leaving us deeply upset and confused. It was really hard for us especially when my friend's beloved cat was among the vanished. Driven by a shared determination, my friend and I began to unravel the truth behind the mysterious disappearances. Our concern deepened as we uncovered a pattern, every cat that vanished had a connection to a particular street. Following this lead, we found ourselves standing before a house, nestled inconspicuously among the others in our peaceful neighborhood. My friend wanted to call the police first, but I rejected that idea as that the police had been ignoring our complaints and didn't believe us, that is why we decided to take matters into our own hands in the first place. We argued so we split up, and he decided to go to ask the local police for help. My friend wanted to call the police first, but I rejected that idea as the police had been ignoring our complaints and didn't believe us, that is why we decide to take matters into our own hands in the first place. I can't blame them, we do have quite a reputation of being rebellious in the neighborhood. I wanted to find evidence first so I decided to enter the building. As my heart pounded, I slowly approached the door, determined to find the truth, my trembling hands slowly grasping the cold doorknob. It was locked, but I easily unlocked it using a bobby pin. Once inside, the stench of despair and fear drowned me. Cages lined the basement, each containing a terrified cat, eyes filled with haunting terror. Many were meowing noisily, as if to beg me to get them out of this hell. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. What a psychopath! Some of them were hurt and roughly bandaged. How could they cruelly inflict such pain upon these innocent creatures? My breath ragged as I studied the dimly lit basement. The flickering light bulb added an eerie vibe down the damp, moldy walls. One cat, a delicate Siamese, met my gaze with eyes that seemed as filled with despair. Those poor eyes tore at my soul. I somehow realized that these animals had endured untold horrors, trapped in this nightmarish dungeon. As I inched closer to the cages, trying to maintain my composure, the psychopath's intentions became chillingly clear. There were signs of torture, the marks of a deranged mind etched into the walls and floor. I felt their despair, my eyes were watery for the torment they had to endure, my own breath now mirroring the anxious panting of the innocent prisoners. I found Luca, my friend's cat, staring at me in horror. He seemed to be too tired and traumatized even to make sounds. My fingers, trembling with a mix of fear and anger, instinctively reached for my phone. I needed to document this nightmare, to have evidence that would help bring this monster to justice. I stealthily snapped a photo, the faint click of the camera barely audible over the soft cries of the imprisoned felines. But my curiosity proved my undoing. As I tried to snap a photo as evidence, the creaking of a floorboard alerted the psychopath to my presence. He suddenly appeared and lunged at me, wielding a rusted knife. My screams echoed through the basement as he drew closer, his laughter was just so sickening. <laughs> His face, I had never seen such madness in my life, was filled with menace. In that moment, I was cornered, and there was no escape. 
The acrid smell of fear permeated the air as I backed into a cage, the sharp edges of its bars digging into my back. I could feel my pulse pounding in my throat, my heartbeats echoing through the room like a war drum signaling my impending doom. I did learn martial arts, but this guy is strong and has a weapon. The blade glinted in the dim light as he closed in, his maniacal grin growing wider. He seemed to notice my terror, feeding off it like a predator. As he raised the knife, poised to strike, I mustered my energy to kick him on his torso. The world around me blurred, and time seemed to slow to a crawl. I noticed he was on the floor, groaning as he held his torso in pain, but slowly gaining composure himself. I also noticed that the rusted knife made a large enough cut on my left thighs. I wasn't sure if I could protect myself at this point. Then, in the distance, the haunting wail of police sirens pierced the silence, growing louder and more urgent with each passing second. The psychopath froze, his deranged smile faltering. Panic gripped him as he realized the police were closing in. As the sirens blared and the sound of approaching footsteps echoed in the basement, the madman's eyes widened with a mixture of fear and rage. He hesitated, torn between finishing what he started and fleeing to escape justice. In that critical moment, the door burst open and a group of armed police officers stormed the basement, their weapons drawn. Shouting commands, they moved swiftly to apprehend the psychopath, who, in his panic, dropped the knife and raised his hands in surrender. The room was lit up in the cold, unforgiving light of police flashlights, revealing the horrors within. As the officers arrested the kidnapper and rescued the cats, I felt a mix of relief and dread wash over me. I had narrowly escaping a gruesome fate. The horrors I had uncovered were beyond comprehension, and my neighborhood would never be the same. The rescued cats, freed from their cages, their trembling bodies slowly relaxing as they were carried to safety. The Siamese, the one that had met my gaze earlier, was among them, and I couldn't help but feel a profound sense of connection with the fragile souls I had vowed to protect. The psychopath was led away in handcuffs, his eyes filled with a twisted mix of defiance and fear. Justice would be served, and the neighborhood could finally breathe a collective sigh of relief as the police secured the scene and the rescued cats were taken to safety, I couldn't help but reflect on the terrible ordeal the cats had to go through. I had stumbled upon a nightmare, a hidden world of cruelty, and my life would forever be marked by the haunting images of that basement. The cats would heal and find new homes, but the scars left on my soul would never fully fade. The horror story of the neighborhood's missing cats was over, but the nightmares that would haunt my sleep were just beginning. The Abandoned School Building Avery Some secrets, buried deep in the darkness of the past, were never meant to be unearthed. I can't believe what happened at school last month. It was like something out of a scary movie, but it was real and it was happening to my best friend, Greg. It all started on a gloomy, overcast afternoon when we decided to explore the old, abandoned school building at the edge of town. We thought it would be fun to check it out, even though everyone said it was haunted. As we entered the school, the air got colder inside, strangely colder, because it was sweltering hot outside. I felt a heavy unease settle in my chest, but I brushed it off as nerves. Greg, on the other hand, was excited, like he couldn't wait to uncover the mysteries within those decaying walls. It was as if he was drawn to something in there. We explored the dark hallways, our footsteps echoing eerily through the empty building. The peeling wallpaper and broken windows made it all the more unsettling. We had heard rumors about the toilet on the third floor, the one that no one dared to enter. There were lots of rumors about strange sounds, whispers, and even sightings of apparitions. Everyone knew the rule, stay away from that toilet. But Greg was different. He had always been a thrill seeker, and he didn't believe in ghosts. 
He wanted to see if the rumors were true, and he was determined to break the rules. We argued about it as we made our way down the dimly lit corridor. I begged him to turn back, my fear growing with every step, but he insisted. We reached the third floor toilet, and it was exactly as they had described it, old, decrepit, and covered in a thick layer of dust. The air was damp and smelled like mold. My heart pounded in my chest, hoping all the rumors were just, well, rumors. Greg stood in front of the entrance, a wicked grin on his face, taunting my fear. Come on, don't be such a chicken, he said, and I could see the excitement in his eyes. He pushed the creaking door open, and it groaned as if in protest. The darkness beyond swallowed him up, and I hesitated at the threshold. The rule had always been clear, but my best friend had crossed the line. I entered the toilet, fearing what we might find inside. The atmosphere was suffocating, and it was even colder in the toilet. It's almost as if someone turned on the AC in this heat. I tried to ignore unsettling logic, but I felt the chill that led to immediate goosebumps. As I followed Greg deeper into the toilet, my footsteps echoed in the narrow, claustrophobic space. The rustling of unseen creatures scuttling in the corners added to my unease. We reached the end of the corridor where an old, cracked mirror hung. Something about it made me shiver in horror, the sinister air around it was unmistakable. I asked Greg to leave now, but he insisted on staying longer. Greg's eyes were fixed on the mirror, a strange intensity in his gaze. I begged him not to touch it, but he confidently touched the mirror, but to my surprise, nothing happened. He couldn't help but chuckle, teasing me for my earlier reaction. My fears appeared to have been unfounded, and I felt a slight sense of relief. We continued our exploration of the eerie bathroom, the cold, dimly lit corridor feeling restless as we ventured further in. The rustling of bugs and rodents in the corners added to the overall unease, creating an atmosphere thick with tension. Greg had been relentless in making fun of me as we explored the spooky, abandoned toilet. He teased me relentlessly, his laughter filling the eerie silence of the abandoned bathroom. His confidence seemed unwavering, and I felt a mixture of annoyance and unease. However, our amusement took a sudden turn. Greg fell strangely silent, his laughter coming to an abrupt halt. Concerned, I called out his name multiple times, but there was no response. Greg? 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 No answer. A growing sense of dread gnawed at me as I watched him stand there, motionless and unresponsive. My anxiety got the better of me, and I slowly approached him. I reached out, placing my hands on his shoulders, and gently turned him around. What I saw shocked the hell out of me, his eyes were bloodshot red, and his voice, when he finally spoke, was disturbingly different. In a tone that felt utterly alien, he asked me, what do you want? In that horrifying moment, as I stood face to face with my best friend, Greg, who had undergone a terrifying transformation, his grip on my shoulders tightened. His fingers dug into my flesh, and he began to choke me, his bloodshot eyes filled with an unsettling coldness. Panic surged through me, and I gasped for breath, struggling to free myself from his powerful grasp. With every ounce of strength I could muster, I fought to escape, desperately clawing at his hands. But as I struggled, Greg's unnatural strength became apparent. He flung me back with an unimaginable force that sent me crashing into the bathroom wall. I felt a pang of pain surge through my head and shoulders as I made contact, and I groaned in agony. I touched my neck and saw blood, my blood dripping from my injured head. As I lay there, dazed and hurting, I watched in horror as Greg's sinister laughter echoed through the toilet. It was a chilling, maniac sound, a stark contrast to the friend I had known. I was trapped, 
helpless, and fear clung to me like a suffocating blanket. I knew I had to find a way to stop whatever had taken hold of him. As I looked around the toilet, I found a faded photograph hanging on the wall. It depicted a group of students from the past, and one of the faces in the photo looked eerily similar to the shadowy figure behind Greg in the mirror. With every ounce of my strength, I reached out for the photograph hanging on the wall. It felt as if my very survival depended on tearing it from its place. My fingers closed around the aged paper, and I yanked it free. The moment it crumpled in my hand, a blood-curdling scream of anguish pierced the air, which came from my best friend. I could feel a surge of powerful energy coursing through me, as if I had tapped into some ancient, forbidden force. The old, cracked mirror shattered into a thousand fractured pieces. In the aftermath, Greg lay on the tiled floor, dazed and disoriented, the redness in his eyes replaced by confusion and vulnerability. He was himself once more, yet his memory of the harrowing possession was a hazy, unsettling blur. Relief flooded through me knowing that Greg was okay. We wasted no time in making our frantic exit from the haunted toilet, our hearts pounding with a chaotic mix of fear and relief. As we retreated from the abandoned school, I couldn't help but reflect on the horrors I had witnessed that day. If you found any enjoyment in the video, I implore you to click that like button and subscribe if you dare.